Hark, we are here. It is time for yet another adventure in Star Wars Unlimited with your favorite constantly incorrect content creator who doesn't play the game. That's right, it's Ryback Stun. This week, kind of a quiet week given the holidays and all the other different things, but that doesn't mean we don't have anything to showcase. So I did cut my hair this week. So some of the images in the video are gonna be a little inconsistent as I have long and then now short hair, including this video. But you guys don't care about haircuts. What you should do is sit back, relax, enjoy the content we are here to provide for you and get hyped for Star Wars Unlimited. Our first two previews come by way of the Golden Dice podcast, which also has an attached Jeremy's Rin interview into it. So go check that out after you finish this video. Down below is the link to it. We've got two events here to go over. So let's hit this first one. This card is called Bamboozle. It is a two cost cunning heroism trick event. You may discard a cunning card from your hand instead of paying this event's cost. Exhaust a unit and return each upgrade on it to its owner's hand. It is an uncommon. It is number 199 out of 252 in SOR. So Bamboozle fits a lot more into cunning heroism pseudo control base you're still exhausting it like you would uh no good to be dead or asteroid sanctuary but it also allows you to return the upgrades to your opponent's hand now a couple of different things about this if token upgrades so experience and shield tokens right now ever leave the field in any way shape or form they cease to exist so they don't go to the discard pile they don't go to your hand they cannot be shuffled into your deck and they can't go to any other pile that would exist later in the game such as like a remove from game pile they just are gone. So if your opponent has something, whether it's a big attacker that has like a, a lightsaber and a shield token and an experience token, you can bamboozle it to exhaust it so it can't attack that round and then also return the lightsaber to the hand and remove the other two token upgrades. So it's a pretty interesting way for two cost to effectively get rid of shields or experience tokens or to force the opponent to pay more to get the big upgrades onto their cards if that's the way you choose to use them. Now the interesting thing about this card is, is that this has one of those replacement cost effects which are very popular in a lot of games if you discard a cunning card so the effectively this becomes a two card cost for doing what it says you don't pay the, the event's cost which means it is not affected by the aspect penalty so if you wanted to run this in, in like a Boba Fett cunning cunning deck with Bosk you normally would have to pay four for this because you're one aspect out of your aspect range but by discarding the cunning card you don't pay the cost at all so you you play bamboozle you discard a cunning card and now you've got an event that triggers bosks to damage you get to use the bamboozle effect all the other different things that are associated with that i don't think this is worth that i think that cunning villainy already has a lot of really good effects i mean this card is okay it's it's good for heroism. It's OK for cunning in general, but no good to me. Dead is far better than bamboozle, even for the cost replacement effect, because while it won't cost you any resources, it does cost you a card from hand and cards from hand are very important. Even if you're drawing up a bunch of cards, it's still a resource that you need to be able to use. Anybody that plays Yu-Gi-Oh can tell you cards in hand are one of the most important resources in the entire game. But that's also because Yu-Gi-Oh doesn't really have a resource system. Anyway, bamboozle is an interesting card exhausting unit and returning upgrades back to the owner's hand can be effective this might be a very impactful sideboard card but i don't see this being a main deck card our next card is just a flat heroism event and it is a very interesting design the card is called metal ceremony it is a zero cost heroism rebel event give an experience token to each of up to three rebels that attacked this phase. It is a common, it is number 250, 245 out of 252, excuse me, in SOR. So this is our medal ceremony. Luke and Han get their medals. Chewie, of course, left out because those jerks. But ultimately, this is a building piece, a combo piece for the rebel attacks decks. This slots right into Command Leia because she wants to attack with multiple attackers. If you get the actual thing set up with where you attack with her, you use the attack ability of her leader side to attack with two things. Then you flip her and put her into play. Then on the next one of your turns, your activations, you attack with her and attack with another rebel. That's four rebels 
theoretically that have attacked if they survive on the board, then you can play Metal Ceremony to give an experience token to each of them. Now, a lot of people have been pretty down on this card because bare minimum, it's a zero for zero, right? It's you lose a card to do nothing because you do need rebel units to be attacking. But rebels do want to attack and they do generally have a lot of units that can attack. They also have a lot of cheap units that can attack. R2D2, 3PO, Pathfinder, Operative, Ezra, Sabine. They're all rebels that want to be attacking and doing things. And again, the Leia strategy opens up to be able to do this. This has a little, if you build your Sabine deck to be rebel aligned, it does have some usefulness to it. If you build your Hera deck to be rebel aligned along with spe Spectres, this also has some pretty interesting design space for that deck. But you do need to be attacking with at least two rebels in a phase, in a round, in order to be able to activate this ability to gain advantage off of it. A zero cost, if you've attacked with one rebel, a zero cost given an experience token at the cost of a card probably isn't worth using that card. But if that wins you the game, it's absolutely worth the card. It just it just depends on what your board state is, what your opponent's board state is, and what you're willing to give up to be able to play Metal Ceremony. I imagine this is definitely going to be sideboard for more aggressive, for less aggressive, main deck for more aggressive rebel decks. But it just depends on how you think your opponent's going to be able to control your board. Because if your opponent is able to just clear your board, after you do your attacks, then Metal Ceremony is a dead card in your hand. Obviously, sure, you can resource it, but that's not the point. The point is you want to use this and be able to use it. And I think it's a great card, but I do understand why a lot of people wouldn't. Our next card comes by way of Unlimited FFG Twitter account, and it is a new leader, a leader we haven't seen before, and she's kind of good. We have here Jin Urso resisting oppression. She is a cunning heroism leader, rebel, Action, exhaust, attack with a unit. The defender gets minus one, minus zero for this attack. Epic action, if you control six or more resources, deploy this leader, four, seven. Number 18 out of 252, a common in SOR. And then the other side, if I can get this to work, is Jin Urso, six cost, cunning heroism, four power, seven health rebel. While a friendly unit is attacking, the defender gets minus one, minus zero. Jin is a control deck that focuses on using attacking units in order to be able to defeat your opponent's units while not losing your own units with that minus one, minus zero. What that means is, is that if you attack a base, it, the effect doesn't apply. Jin Urso still allows you to attack it because it says attack with a unit. You're attacking the base, the defender is not a unit, therefore it doesn't get minus one, minus zero. Being able to clear out your opponent's units by not taking as much damage means that your opponent has to do more work to either pull Jin off the board, which at seven health is not that hard, especially for six resources, or make it so that there are extra things they have to do to clear the board. So if you have a bunch of units that are survived by one health and your opponent has like a fifth brother with a fallen lightsaber, Jin's ability hasn't really done anything for you because they can still attack, still wipe out a bunch of units off the board and then not have to do anything. But if you are willing to sit there and throw your units at things to clear other units off the board, which you should be, that's the primary way of controlling your opponent's units that are on the board, attack them with your own units. And once your opponent has no more units to be able to perform their tempo and get the combo into play of attacking and attacking and attacking, that's when you're able to get that pressure on your opponent's base. However, against an aggression deck, not necessarily the, the actual aspect, but the playstyle aggro, this ability is not as good because your opponent doesn't care. Sure, clear my board of units. I'm just going to keep putting out cheap units to be able to do things with, and you're not going to have enough firepower to clear them all off the board. I think Jin is a great leader, especially for limited formats, because she is the common, and the ability to attack with her actual thing and reduce the attack of an oppos opposing defender by minus one for that attack does have benefits to it, but it is also kind of along the lines of Jetta City where you're paying for something that may do nothing for you. So it just depends. I think that there's going to be a lot of people that really like this leader and a lot of people who are probably going to main this leader right off the bat. I still believe that Cunning is the best aspect in the game right now. Other people have different opinions, but right now, based upon the cards that we've seen, Cunning is absolutely out of its mind right now. But Cunning Heroism is lagging behind on Cunning Villainy. So we'll have to see how Jin is able to respond. 
onto them. It'll also be interesting to see how the playstyle of Jin decks go up against the playstyle of Han decks. I know Han is more bursty with its resource allocation and being able to put resources into play for the round to then lose them at the next round. But I think both of them are probably still going to be pretty controlly or aggressive decks. So it really just depends or mid range. I mean, everything could be everything. Realistically, how good that is, it depends on how either good you are, how good your deck building skills or how good the cards that you put into your deck is. Jin or so resisting oppression. Another Rogue One leader. Our final preview of the week comes by way of the unlimited FFG Twitter account. It is our last preview for cunning month, as it were. And it's an event. This is a big one. This is Out Maneuver. Three cost cunning only tactic event. Choose an arena, ground or space. Exhaust each unit in that arena. It is an uncommon number 221 out of 252 in SOR. This is one of those arena wipes that people have been looking for for a while in terms of what things are capable of. Right now, Overwhelming Barrage is a very powerful card that can wipe out a lot of units on the board, but it's not, unless there's not that many units on the board, it's not gonna be clearing the whole arena in that aspect. Outmaneuver only does it for one round, but it is pretty effective. And on top of that, it also does it for the entire arena, not just your opponent's side, but your side as well. So if you can set up something to the effect of start your round with outmaneuver, choose, let's say, ground, exhaust all your opponent's ground units. They now have to work within cards they can play that have ambush or put themselves into play ready or use other events to try to unexhaust things or just change their strategy to build up, defend, and then claim the initiative while you are free to play any of your ambush units, utilize your energy conversion lab uh, ambush to be able to get things onto the board. Outmaneuver is a very interesting balancing point and potentially, depending on how many shenanigans you can get into, opportunities for you to eliminate your opponent's units without too much clapback. And on top of that, unimpeded progress towards destroying your opponent's base. If there is ever any abilities that deal extra damage or affect exhausted units, Outmaneuver is a really good opportunity for you to be able to use that to just exhaust one arena and then start using those effects of either when exhausted or if a unit is exhausted, do this, those types of things. We haven't seen those just yet, but I have to imagine they're coming because it's free design space, right? Outmaneuver, very interesting card, an opportunity to give pause to the game to allow you to set up or to take advantage of boards that you can utilize extra come into play ready strategies, which is pretty neat. We're going to have a little bit of a ramble section. I haven't played the game since the first couple of games I played with a friend at a local store to get, get a feel of how the game is going to play with the first set of like, I think it was one of the first 30 card decks we could make that were similar to what the starter decks were supposed to be, but more uh, efficient, more copies of cards that are necessary and less copies of cards that are not necessary. I got a feel for the game. I understood the way the game was played. I understood the highs and lows of different things. When I say I don't play the game, it's not that I'm not going to play the game. I'm absolutely going to play the game. If I were to start playing the game now, I would be learning the game in a meta that doesn't actually exist. I don't begrudge anybody else Else playing the game. I do worry that people pick up bad habits when they play a game in a meta that will never actually exist because we are never going to experience a section of official gameplay when the game releases when all of set one is not in play. So that's why I don't really play the game. But I was sitting here fiddling with some things. I do make deck ideas. Let's get over here and showcase this really quick. I'm going to try not to ramble too much. The last two decks that I have here, Looming Vader and Force Fet, I built before deciding to record this video and the reason why I decided to record this specific section was to kind of explain that I have an idea for these decks in my head you can see at the bottom here there's Hera Vigilance there's Inquisitive Vigilance there's a, a shell for uh, Cunning Cunning Boba but I had an idea of well Boba Fett really wants to kill things and I like Fifth Brother a lot so what can I do to create a deck that allows me to get more killy while also using uh, things like Fifth Brother. So I did create a deck here, and you'll note it's uh, three Death Star Stormtroopers, three Greedos, three Boba Fetts, three Cell Block Guards, three Fifth Brothers, three Bosks, three Emperor Palpatines, three Headhunters, three Defenders, three Im Imperial Interceptors, three Fetts Fire Spray, two Chimeras, three Shoot First, three No Good to Me Dead, three Surprise Strike, three Waylay, and three Fallen Lightsaber. Now this deck actually runs two more events than I would normally play just because I try to 
to limit my events to 10, but I do recognize that Greedo wants more non-unit cards. So I do technically have 15 total non-units, which is a, a good spread, we'll say. But as I'm going through here, seeing that I have Fifth Brother, which is Force, I have Emperor Palpatine, which is Force, and both of those highly benefit from Fallen Lightsaber. The main problem is, is that to get this big ability that I want from Fallen Lightsaber, I only have six cards that can even play that. So while I do appreciate the shell of what this deck has created, it uses a lot of cards that I'm probably going to use for most Boba Fett decks anyway. No Good to Me Dead is a recent addition to my Boba Fett strategies because it doesn't technically do what Boba Fett wants it to do, but it does keep the game in control. But by not having the Force units to be able to equip the Fallen Lightsaber on properly, sure, I could equip this plus three, plus three on any uh, character, but I'm spending three to just give a three, three and use an action for that. Why not spend a three to get a three, three and the extra bonus effect by playing it with these cards? And the problem is, is that the other force units that I know are going to be in the set, we don't know about yet. So if I were to sit here and play this deck, I would get an idea on how this deck plays in a meta that doesn't exist. Let's go to the other deck, Looming Vader here. Three Death Star Stormtroopers, three Mahdi, three First Legion Snowtroopers, three uh, Snowtrooper Lieutenants, three Cellblock Guard, three Fifth Brother, three General Veers, three Emperor Palpatine, two TIE Fighter, two Disabling Fang Fighter, three Imperial Interceptor, three TIE Advance, three Force Choke, two I Am Your Father, three Aggression, three Maximum Firepower, two Vader's Lightsaber, three Fallen Lightsaber, and that is the full deck. So this deck is actually running 16 non-units and the rest actual units. The reason why I'm a little bit more comfortable with this deck, especially with Fallen Lightsaber, is that Vader himself is also a force unit. So I have seven total force units in this deck that could run it. But I still don't really feel comfortable trying to figure this list out right now because this is built based upon everything that is available at this moment. Disabling Fang Fighter might not be something that sticks around. TIE Fighter might not be something that sticks around. I Am Your Father could switch over to Open Fire. There's a bunch of different things that are available uh, in terms of what I could play in this deck that's viable. I do know. If I were to play this deck IRL, Cell Block Guard, Fifth Brother, Emperor Palpatine, Vader's Lightsaber, Fallen Lightsaber are probably all going to be in the deck pretty much no matter what. And if I'm doing double aggression, aggression is going as well. Not having access to the whole set leads me to believe that there are holes in this deck that need to be filled that we can't fill yet. Now, if people want to sit there and test to their heart's delight about things that they come out with and things that they want to be able to play and do their YouTube videos or just play in general to get a feel for the game, that's perfect. Perfectly fine. My problem is showcasing the results of early tournaments or gameplay without the full set as empirical evidence that a, a card is good, B card is bad, C card is complete garbage, and if you play C card, you're a garbage player too. That kind of stuff really bothers me and is why I don't play the game. It's going to get a lot better once we start moving into doing previews from set one to set two, set two to set three, so on and so forth, where there's less of a window of people getting up in arms about previews in terms of what's good, what's bad, playing things right off the bat. I know people want to get in, they want to play the game, and I'm, I'm super hyped for people being hyped for the game. But there is a difference between being hyped for the game and setting yourself up for failure by playing in aspects of the game that realistically will never exist. If that's a problem, I apologize. That's just the way that I look at things. Now, that doesn't mean I'm never going to play the game until release. I, I'm considering playing it right now with these two decks and testing things out. I'm also considering playing it when we get to like 80% of the known card base because there will be fewer cards that will really change the landscape of decks and we'll be able to get things out. There's a Sabine aggro aggro deck that I really want to play, aggressive, aggressive, whatever, but doesn't have enough good aggressive aggression cards to play right off the bat. And that's kind of my, my experience of, I sit here and I build decks and I'm like, this idea is cool, this idea is cool. But then I start getting into the last eight, 10, 12 cards to put into a deck and, and it's all suboptimal plays to me where I'm using cards that aren't relevant to the main strategy or they don't further my main strategy and they're just cards to put into the deck to fill the deck. And that doesn't feel good. And that is all she wrote for the week. Like I said, quiet week. That's why we added that little extra section in to talk about why I do things the way that I do them personally here on the Ryback Stun YouTube channel. And I have a string caught here. Interesting things that have come out of come out of the game. I believe there is a stream right after this. So make sure you go check that out over on the FFG YouTube channel. I don't actually remember what it's about. I could have looked it up before I recorded this, but I decided not to because I am tired. Anyway, that's it. 
Let me know what you think about all the different things we talked about today in the comments below. Make sure to like the video because that helps out a lot. Subscribe to the channel if you could, please. That also helps. Follow me on all my social media platforms. Ryback's done pretty much everywhere that I want to be. And we look forward to more Star Wars Unlimited content in the near future. Aspect previews are finished. So we have a wide open future about what's remaining to showcase in the game. We're still missing a couple of leaders. We're still missing a bunch of legendaries and power cards. Still missing a couple of key pieces and specific strategies, especially for things like force, like we talked about earlier. So it'll be very interesting to see where Star Wars Limited takes us moving forward. And with that, I will see you in the stars.